All right. So once again, I'm Andrew Hagan. I'm a, I'm a marine forecaster at the National Hurricane Center's Tropical Analysis and Forecast Branch. We have two speakers today. Darren Fergurski is the branch chief of the Ocean Forecast Branch at the Ocean Prediction Center. He'll be going first. And then second, we have Chris Lancy, the branch chief, my boss, of the Tropical Analysis and Forecasting Branch at the National Hurricane Center. Uh, so Darren, you could go ahead and begin when you're ready. Hey, Andrew, thank you very much. I just want to take a moment to thank everybody for uh, taking the time out of your day to be with us today, no matter where you are around the world. Thank you for, for being with us. I have my screen on. I'm going to turn off my webcam real quick. It's a little distracting for me when I do my presentation, but I'll come back on with it when we do a question and answer session. Uh, many thanks to Andrew for facilitating today. And just as we go through the presentation, if you do have questions, Go ahead and put those in the chat or the question part, and we'll try to get to as many of those as we can at the end of the presentation. If there are questions that we're not able to answer the time we have, we'll go ahead and follow up uh, via email. So with that, again, I'm Darren Fergurski. I'm the Operations Branch Chief at the uh, National Weather Service's Ocean Prediction Center. And I just want to talk a little bit about our home, the Ocean Prediction Center is located along with the National Hurricane Center as part of the National Centers for Environmental Prediction. And the uh, tropical marine forecasting arm down there, the one that does marine forecasting is a tropical analysis and forecast branch uh, that Chris Lancy is in charge of the operations of. And again, I'm in charge of the operations at the Ocean Prediction Center. You can see the other uh, uh, other centers made it, making up the, uh, the NSEP on the screen there, uh, several of which you may know about, uh, others you may not know so much about, but you can take some time to look online about all the centers that have an important role in weather forecasting around the United States and across the world. So with that, I wanna talk about the Pacific forecast area. And uh, the, the areas are divided up, kind of like you see on the screen here at the Ocean Prediction Center. We have our offshore forecasts in the darker blue, kind of the zones right off the uh, west coast of the United States, making up about the area, the EEZ or the exclusive economic zone. And then the area that we do the high seas is located in a little bit of the lighter shade of blue going west from the continent of the US, westward to 160 east. And for the high seas forecast, that's where we're the authoritative voice for uh, warnings and other forecasts on the high seas of the Pacific. Uh, the Tropical Analysis and Forecast Branch of the National Hurricane Center does the area in green with the offshore uh, zones in the darker green, the lighter shade with their high seas. And then the uh, Forecast Office in Honolulu, Hawaii does the area in the purple and got to note uh, the uh, state of Alaska and the WFOs up there, the Weather Forecast Offices doing offshore forecasts and coastal forecasts around that large state. Uh, we do, though, radio fax charts off to Asia. So even though our high seas forecasts only go out to 160 east, we'll have radio fax charts that go east to the far east part of Asia. I wanted to give just a shout out real quick of the Atlantic forecast area. Even though we're for focusing on the Pacific for this presentation, I wanted to note the Atlantic forecast area shaded here again, blue for the Ocean Prediction Center, green for the Tropical Analysis Forecast Branch, what I'll call now TAF-B, uh, we're the authoritative voice out to uh, 35 West for warnings and forecasts on the high seas. But like on the Pacific side going east, our radio fax charts will go all the way out to uh, Europe and Northern Africa. And that's all done because of the med areas. Uh, the uh, World Meteorological Organization divides the world, world up into meteorological areas for forecasting. And this is where each nation has its own part of uh, the marine world for them to be, again, the authoritative voice uh, for marine forecasts and marine warnings in their parts of the world. We have met areas 12 and met area four uh, shown here on this, on this graphic. So why do we do what we do? I'm gonna talk a, a little bit of why we do what we do, show a little bit of our products. Chris is gonna do a little more in detail on the products, but uh, over the North Atlantic and the North Pacific, there are many, many extra tropical hurricane force lows uh, and these are just a heat map of all of those hurricane force lows in both of those basins since 2005. On average, each year, the Pacific has 40, 
36 rather, uh, extra tropical hurricane force lows. The Atlantic has 45, and that's just the hurricane force lows. That doesn't make up all of the many, many, many gale storm force uh, lows that, that occur out there. And so each year at the Ocean Prediction Center, uh, we issue on average about five figures in terms of warnings for each uh, base in the North Pacific and the North Atlantic. And so it's it's quite a few of them kind of uh, notes the vulnerability of vessels out in the open ocean for really, really major weather events. I also want to put up this screen here because we get uh, by email notifications from the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency of hazardous conditions that may, may be going on or, or significant events. And some of these emails may be cable laying, space debris, derelict vessels, uh, maybe some you know ongoing thing with uh, you know unfortunately maybe sometimes with piracy and the like, but there are you know, other unfortunate events too that we get with distress signals or people overboard or a, a vessel sinking. Uh, actually today I got one and included on the screen with I think a small vessel was was cut in half, and so all of these you know, may be related to weather maybe not but it just again goes to the vulnerability of the vessels out over the open ocean and why we at the ocean prediction center and and chris's office in taffy and other marine offices in the weather service and around the world want to make sure that critical decision makers have the best forecasts and warnings possible darren um, darren I, there are three people that said they could they couldn't hear anything yet um for the entire presentation i think um so yeah i think we should stop for a second and let me try to unmute unmute somebody and and get confirmation to see if anybody has has been uh, been able to hear this um, i will pause andrew can you hear me yes i i could hear the whole thing everything was fine to me but chris lancy and the um a, we got a few raised hands and all of them said they couldn't they couldn't hear anything so let me just uh see that okay i'll stand by Okay. Yeah, give us one second, folks. Um, Chris Lancy, can you uh, unmute yourself? Uh, let me see if I can unmute. No, mute. Make panelist. Test, test, test. Um, who is saying that? Was that you, no, Darren? Darren? This is Darren. Yeah. Let me see here. I mean, everyone should be able to audio. I mean, I'm looking at all the attendees. They should be able to hear. Um, can um, attendees, if you can hear me, can you either type in the chat in the chat feature? Um, can people? Here, let me see. And I'll do a couple of tests. Test, test, test. This is Darren at the Ocean Prediction Center. Test, test, test. The audience, if you're able to see my chat, if you're able to, someone's able to reply to that chat. Um, let's see. Questions. Okay, so uh, people still can hear, can see the slides changing. Um, in the questions tab is really where people have been um, responding here. So, yeah, so I'm gonna, this is Darren again, just doing another test, 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 test. No, no. What time were these were these test, test, test. questions sent? This is weird. Let me see here. Um, hmm, I'm not sure what to do. What do you think I should do? Because do you see test test Darren, test? Do you, Darren, do, are do you see do you see um, you see the questions in the questions tab? So I couldn't yesterday because I'm not a moderator. But um, so Andrew, you can hear me. I can hear you. Chris, oh, yeah, now. Said he can't hear me and he can't hear you either. Four, so, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, there's like eight, there's like eight, um, nine, 10, 11. Everyone says no audio. All right. Yeah. 
let's do um, let's do this okay so he keeps hearing the webinar will begin shortly please remain on the line so did did you start it did you start the webinar yeah yeah i did but let me i'm looking through all the tabs now to make sure there's not like not a button on the audio i'm missing here like audio tab everything looks good i mean unless i somehow um the attendees tab the attendees should be able to unmute mute all other participants unmute all participants yeah so what he keeps saying is we'll have we'll have full audio control okay i just unmuted all the attendees i just wanted to see what that does uh um if one of the attendees can well if they can't hear me that then you know <laughs> then i don't know what good it is if they're going to try to talk um yeah so i wonder when you went on to start the webinar what did you click oh start broadcast is that oh <laughs> okay. i'm sorry everyone my fault um okay give me just a second to unmute the participants i mean to mute all the participants are muted um I, all right, let's just continue where you left off then, or, or you can start over again. We we probably should start over, so uh, okay. let's go ahead and do that. And uh, apologize, folks. Hey, I'm I'm Darren Fergerski. I'm the operations Michael. branch chief at the uh, at the Ocean Prediction Center, and my counterpart, Dr. Chris Lancey, will be talking in a little bit about the National Hurricane Center and the uh, tropical analysis and forecast branch, which is the marine forecasting arm of the National Hurricane Center. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, products and services. I'm gonna talk a lot about why we do what we do. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Chris Lancey. Uh, we'll talk about uh, more about the products and services, particularly about the, 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 the tropical Pacific. And again, apologies for, for the technical difficulties, but it sounds like folks can hear us now. And uh, we are recording the presentation. So I want everybody to know that we are recording this. And I'm gonna turn my webcam off because it's a little distracting for me. When we get to the question and answer session, uh, I'll turn it back on and feel free to put your questions in the chat. We'll get to those as, as quickly as we can, the time allowed. And we may go over, just because we had the technical difficulties, we may go over uh, the top of the hour just a little bit, but we'll try to make up some time. So with that, I'm turn off my webcam and begin again. So uh, the Ocean Prediction Center and the National Hurricane Center are uh, nine of are, are two of the, uh, the nine centers that make up the National Centers for Environmental Prediction. And you can see the other centers located here on the screen, a uh, storm prediction center that focuses on uh, severe weather, particularly tornado severe thunderstorm watches, uh, the uh, weather prediction center that looks at a lot of flash flooding, uh, works with us pretty closely in terms of our surface analyses, uh, actually does a lot of winter weather forecasting too for around the United States, Environmental Modeling Center, which does a lot of the research and implementation of computer models, our NCEP Central Operations, which has all the data running through the supercomputers and helps to make the models go and so on. You can see the rest here, uh, but it's a very important uh, role that the Weather Service has through NCEP uh, for uh, continental United States forecasting, uh, outside the continental United States forecast, outside the continental United States forecasting, as well as forecasting around the world, and uh, our Pacific forecast area for marine purposes is located is shown on this map here, and in blue is the area of the Ocean Prediction Center. The dark blue off the west coast of the United States is, is our offshore zones, uh, which is about 250 miles offshore, or so about the uh, area of the exclusive economic zone. Our area farther west from there across the North Pacific uh, is our high seas area that goes out to 160 east. In green, the offshore zones in darker color and the high seas area in the lighter green color are the high seas for the Pacific uh, done by the National Hurricane Center's uh, TAFB, Tropical Analysis and Forecast Branch. And I'll refer to it as TAFB for short uh, from here on out in the presentation. The Honolulu office in the purple and then the Alaska offshore areas and coastal areas up above around that state. Uh, again, the high seas forecasts are done out to 160 east where we're the authoritative voice for marine forecasts and warnings on the open ocean. But note that our radio facts charts go all the way west uh, to the far east part of Asia. 
On the Atlantic side, the same color difference is there, blue in the North Pacific for the Ocean Prediction Center side, uh, in the, tro or the, North, in the North Atlantic rather, and uh, the green in the uh, tropical Atlantic for Tappies area, where the authoritative voice for high seas forecasts out to 35 west. But like in the Pacific going west, in the Atlantic going east, we have radio, chart, radio facts charts that go all the way out to Western Europe and Northern Africa. And all that's because we're part of the World Meteorological Organization Med Area Structure, uh, which we forecast for Med Areas 4 and 12. And you can see those here. And we're just part of the entire global suite of uh, national meteorological and hydrologic services that are the authoritative voices for their parts of the world, again, for marine forecasts and warnings. And so why do we do what we do? Well, here's a good slide that really shows why. And across the North Pacific and the North Atlantic, there are many, many extra tropical hurricane force lows. Uh, and on average in the Pacific, there are 36 of those of the North Pacific, 45 in the North Atlantic. And that's not including all of the gale and storm force conditions that occur annually. And so when you make up all the gales and the storms and the hurricane force uh, situations, as well as freezing spray, which we issue warnings for those as well, there are on the order of five figures in terms of the number of warnings uh, that we issue at the Ocean Prediction Center for the North Pacific and the North Atlantic every season. So again, it kind of shows the vulnerability of uh, you know, the, the vessels to the extremes of weather in that, in that part of the world. And also got to note this slide here. So uh, Chris and I uh, subscribe to alerts from the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. And with those alerts, we get things that may, you know, they're important to the mariner, but for us, we kind of look at them just a little bit, cable laying, derelict vessels, space debris, sometimes just general notices of, of, of one thing or another. Uh, but there are also things that, you know, again, kind of point out to why we do what we do for the safety of life at sea, distress signals, uh, vessels that are sinking, uh, persons overboard. Uh, today I got one from the NGA alert about a, a small vessel that was cut in half. Some of these may be related to weather, but not, and not all. But nevertheless, it kind of goes again to the, uh, to the activity of the weather uh, in, in, the, in the marine environment and the need to provide the mariner with uh, information for critical decision making on the open ocean. I wanted to note this slide here. This was one just recently back in October of 2022, actually October 18th, where there was a hurricane force load developing over the uh, eastern North Pacific and moving north into the Gulf of Alaska. And here's a good example of a kind of a success story for the whole weather enterprise, the National Weather Service and all of our partners and customers really uh, getting weather, uh, sharing weather, acting upon the weather uh, to get out of harm's way. Now on the left side on October 17th, around 1622Z, uh, you can see an area of avoidance uh, just to the north and northeast of the developing hurricane force system. And over time, as the hurricane force system moved to the north and northeast, uh, that area of avoidance expanded, and the great circle route of, of vessels going from the northwest U.S. into the Aleutians was broken. And you can really see that in the middle, and particularly the eastern, uh, the, the right slide, uh, the right slide being on October 18th, just before 10Z. In that case, there were four days of advanced forecast with seas of 40 to 45 feet and a real growth of avoidance. I uh, wanted to thank uh, Sea Vision, which is kind of a Department of Defense uh, marine traffic uh, application that we have access to. But this is an example of what we really want from the forecast and the warnings that we issue. People taking heed of those, uh, doing avoidance, making sure they're trying to get out of harm's way. And uh, this is an example of a slide of what we do. Uh, we issue over 150 products each day. You can find many of these, if not all of them, on the internet from the Ocean Prediction Center at ocean.weather.gov. But our offshore waters forecasts available over the internet, a nav text, and the high frequency voice broadcasts um, disseminated with the help of our core partner, the U.S. Coast Guard, our high seas forecast that we type, uh, also shared via, via safety net, and a whole host of 500 millibar charts, uh, surface charts, wind wave charts, wave period charts uh, that we have available through radio fax, through FTP mail, and uh, ways that you can get that as well as the internet to find that information important to you. So again, 150 products each day. I do wanna mention our surface analysis uh, that we do in combination with the, the National Hurricane Center, TAF-B, the Weather Prediction Center, 
the Honolulu Forecast Office. We all do our analyses for our parts of the area that we're responsible for, and then we stitch it together. And at the end of the day, we have a really good representation of the uh, extratropical systems and the tropical systems, the hazards associated with those, the main fronts, where they're going if there's a hazard, and all of that for the Pacific and the Atlantic when combined probably covers roughly about two-thirds of the northern hemisphere. So it's a really neat chart. It's called our Unified Surface Analysis, and you can find that online. I also mentioned already the radio fax schedule. The website is kind of on the bottom there. It's a long one, ended with rfax.pdf, but the most recent version, October 21st, 2022, shows the radio fax schedule. It's a relentless schedule. Most of our forecast deadlines are based on the radio fax schedule. And so it's something that we follow you know, pretty closely. So, because once we're late, uh, the old radio fax goes out and we don't get a chance, a second chance to get that out on radio fax. We definitely try to make those deadlines. I do want to make sure to also note the NOAA component of the U.S. National Ice Center is part of the uh, Ocean Prediction Center now as an ice services branch. And that ice services branch uh, does snow and ice analysis and some decision support services for high latitudes. If the weather gets really, really cold uh, down to the south, they'll do uh, ice forecasting and analysis uh, into uh, certainly through the Great Lakes, which happens every season, but sometimes maybe as far south as, as the Chesapeake Bay. So uh, in addition to the other products and services I mentioned just a little bit ago, uh, we contribute to the National Weather Service's National Digital Forecast Database, uh, in which the uh, TAP-B and WFO Honolulu, our weather forecast office in Honolulu, uh, does the entire basin and the, uh, the tropical Atlantic and the tropical Pacific. In this slide, you see the area around Alaska. And the Ocean Prediction Center right now uh, contributes to the NDFD, basically off the uh, west and east coast of the U.S., uh, you know, roughly again, just past the EEZs. And it's our goal as we uh, you know, are able to uh, get the bandwidth technologically and training and the like to be able to expand that across the uh, full basin of the North Atlantic and the North Pacific as well. But with the NDFD, we can have really specific uh, every three hourly to six hourly forecasts of winds and seas and hazards and uh, things like freezing spray. And we think that's a good contribution to things like uh, maybe like Ectus that we'll talk about in a little while, uh, where that can be a part of navigational units uh, as you go across uh, the open ocean. So how we do what we do, uh, certainly observations make a big difference. Vessel observations are very important to us and we use satellite a lot as well to help uh, understand what's going on in the atmosphere. And so on the left slide is a visible satellite imagery. If you were uh, you know, 22,500 miles above the earth and could breathe. Looking down on, on the North Pacific, you wouldn't see the map, but this is what you'd see, a weather a, a, a representation such as you see on the left with a low pressure system here in this case on January 24th of 2020. Uh, south of the Aleutians, very strong low with a front to the southeast and then going to the southwest to the northwest of Hawaii. Other low pressure systems in the swirls over the Gulf of Alaska and just south of there, along with the Western Aleutians. Satellite imagery is very, very important to us. And through satellite imagery, we're able to get uh, altimeters or uh, what we like to refer to those as uh, ability to get uh, wave height measurements out over the open ocean. And in this case, and the right is a picture of a hurricane force lower the Atlantic, but uh, from an altimeter pass near the core of a storm, we were able to see 59 foot seas uh, from that satellite imagery. Uh, satellite imagery also helps us with, with scatterometry or the, the wind direction speed uh, with uh, you know, what's going on up in, in the atmosphere. And in this case, the hotter the colors, the stronger the wind. And on November 26, 2019, in this image here, there were hurricane force conditions with a broad low pressure center off the coast of Oregon and Northern California. Uh, with the brown uh, colors mainly representing storm force conditions and the widespread yellows representing gale force. Forecasters use all this information for situational awareness. And with all the observations that we get, kind of understanding what's going on right now, then we'll start to look at model forecasts. Uh, we'll look at models such as the U.S.'s Global Forecast System or GFS. We'll look at the European Centers for Medium Range Weather Forecast uh, model, the ECMWF. We like the, the uh, United Kingdom's model, there's Canadian models. There's a whole host of models that we look at. Most of the time, they're pretty close. This image here from December 6th of 2021 shows high pressure systems pretty close to one another um, in the uh, Northwest Pacific, as well as closer to the United States. 
with a little bit of difference in low pressure offshore, maybe a little bit of difference in low pressure up over the um, uh, the uh, northern bearing into the Chukchi and Beaufort Seas. But uh, if there are big differences in the model output, uh, we'll look at how they're handling things, how they handle things in the recent past, how are they uh, handling conditions based on the observations and so on. And from there, then meteorologists will make a forecast going out to seven days. I did mention observations and in this image, although this is an old one, I usually like to use it from July of 2015. This is an example of why observations are so important to us. This is out in the, in the North Atlantic. Nova Scotia is up to the northwest part of the screen here. And there's a low pressure system in this comma head appearance here with a front down to the, the southeast and south from the low. Note the observation in here of a northwest wind at 65 knots. The flag plus one line plus a half line equals 65 knots. And so that's hurricane force conditions. So with the observation that we got, we upgraded a storm warning to a hurricane force wind warning, hopefully to at least let other vessels in the area know about the strength of that low pressure system. The model forecast had it close, but really not, not quite right, of course, because it had the low pressure system just to the southwest of the observation. So the, the even though it wasn't, from a standpoint of a global model, that's not too far off, but it's far enough off so that instead of a southeast flow where the ship was at the time, uh, it was instead, you know, northwest flow, hurricane force. And so the observations that we get don't go out into the ether. They're looked at by forecasters. They help improve the models. They get into the models. And so if you have an opportunity to issue a, an observation uh, through the voluntary observing ship scheme, uh, we can really uh, use that help and know that it makes a difference. And here's an example of how the observations around the world um, have a lot of gaps. The reds and the pinks represent just a, the sparsity of observations per grid square, zero to one to five per month. Even where it's the, the I'll call it the brighter colors in the blue 26 to 250 in those grid squares, that could mean as little as you know, maybe one observation a month in the grid square. So uh, we could use more, any observation that you can get is certainly very helpful and no, we appreciate it very much. Here's another example of, again, the need for observations and the, uh, the satellite imagery that, that we get from uh, the polar orbiters, which do the scatterometry for the wind direction and speed, as well as the altimeter for the wave heights, they have gaps in them. They are polar orbiters, so they do sweeps around the globe and uh, from pole to pole, and there are gaps in between those. So sometimes we get lucky, they'll go over a low, but other times they won't. And uh, while we want to certainly uh, vessels not to be in harm's way, uh, we certainly, if you do happen to be in a place, no matter what the conditions are, where you can get an observation, know they help fill in the gaps and help to build the forecaster's understanding and situational awareness. Uh, we do decision support services. Uh, our offices at the Ocean Prediction Center, as well as the uh, at TAF B, we have a close working relationship with our core partner, the U.S. Coast Guard, and we provide decision support services for the U.S. Coast Guard at a variety of timescales. Uh, more frequently, when the weather is is certainly uh, you know getting much more hazardous out over the open ocean, and these decision support services will extend to things like uh, helping. Um, helping groups such as NOAA's Office of Response and Restoration and the Coast Guard, uh, highlighting with divers trying to get uh, oil off of a sunken vessel that may be releasing that, helping to do salvage operations, or other times, unfortunately, for rescue and recovery. And hopefully we aren't doing too many of the latter, uh, but when it's there's a need, we will certainly let our, our Coast Guard uh, core partners know about conditions so they're uh, aviation crews, their diving crews, uh, their vessels going out to meet a vessel in distress aren't put in harm's way in as much as possible, or at least they can understand conditions. I've, I've referenced ACTIS, the Electronic Chart Display Information uh, System, and uh, through our National Digital Forecast Database, uh, we really want to help uh, get more and more data incorporated into ACTIS uh, to help with uh, the whole suite, the whole kind of uh, soup to nuts, if you will, of, of navigation type of needs that a vessel has. And so uh, we really want to be a part of that. And we're working on the international standards uh, to make that better globally. And that kind of goes to the future of high seas forecasts. You're right now, we type high seas forecasts that can be upwards of you know 15,000 characters or more. We type that all uh, four times a day, every six hours. 
And there may be a way to make that, uh, we're working on that right now, to make it more polygon oriented so that the gales, the storm force, the hurricane force conditions, the dangerous seas are noted as polygons as opposed to a lot of words. Uh, we hope we'll, there will always be worded forecasts, but uh, they might be more like the NGA style of of bulletins as opposed to a real, real long a bulletin that goes 15,000 characters or more. And the, in doing that, uh, we want to serve mariners with 21st century information. This is an example of a, uh, a, a forecast from the GFS for November 6, 2022. This is over the North Atlantic, but this is uh, the extra tropical um, uh, transition uh, to the in the Northeast Atlantic of, of former uh, tropical cyclone Martin. And around all that, just a lot of lows that you can see. So you have a low here, a low there, another low southeast of Greenland, another low east of Greenland, a low to the southwest of Greenland, a couple of lows uh, here to the southwest of what was formerly Martin as well. And when we do our high seas forecast, we usually do conditions around each low. But note the, the yellow colors with the gale force conditions here, a little bit of darker color, the browns, uh, probably some storm force conditions. How suitable that is to a polygon, instead of writing things for a myriad of lows, we could all do that in a polygon. And I think how much simpler that would be for the 21st century Mariner. And we're working on that technology to be able to get information out to you. Just a couple more slides. Uh, again, note that uh, with the incorporation of the NOAA component of the U.S. National Ice Center into the Ocean Prediction Center, uh, we are doing much more forecasting and decision support at high latitudes. And our social media, Facebook uh, identifier there, the Twitter handle there. And note the Pacific Hurricane Force low verification I have in the middle of the screen. Note over the last couple, three seasons, how the accuracy of the hurricane force lows has really increased from the Ocean Prediction Center, how the percent under forecast and over forecast have really decreased, uh, which goes to show that when you see a forecast for hurricane force low conditions or for any type of hazardous weather conditions out over the North Pacific or wherever you're going, make sure to heed those because those conditions are very likely to be occurring somewhere in vicinity of that major system. And with that, I will go on mute and turn it over to Chris for his part of the presentation. So Chris, over to you. Okay, let me make Chris a presenter. Thank you very much, Darren. Okay, make presenter. Yes. All right, Chris, you should uh, have control. Go ahead when ready. Uh, we can't, I can't hear you, Chris. Uh, let me see here. Your volume's up. I assume no one else can hear you since I can't hear you. Uh, see, right click. Attendees who can talk. Oh, there you go. Oh, no. I see the button for attendees who can talk. Phone number. Hello? Yes, Andrew? now we can, now I can hear you. And I assume okay. everyone else, if they can't, they will uh, let us know. Yeah, this is okay. clear, Chris, I can hear you, I think. Okay, All right, well, let's ahead. go ahead and get started then. So uh, again, my name is uh, Chris Lancy and I'm the uh, branch chief of the Tropical Analysis and Forecast Branch, uh, which is part, as you can see, the logos down here, part of the National Hurricane Center. And as Darren was explaining, one of the nine national centers within the National Weather Service, which we are all part of NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, so you may know of the, the fisheries component of NOAA and we're all in Department of Commerce because weather affects commerce. And as many of you mariners know, 80% of the global commerce is done on ships. And so this is critical that we provide the best forecasts and services and so that's what we do. We try to help out every single day, to make sure that you have the best analysis and predictions of winds and waves, as well as warnings. Um, so yesterday I had a bad joke about my, my name, which is kind of a little odd. So I'm gonna give a different joke in case there's folks that are listening today to listen yesterday. When my wife and I were Did anyone else lose Chris or is that just me? It looks like Chris broke Chris. It looks like you froze. 
Uh, yeah, I lost. This is Darren. We lost Chris. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. Let's give it a few seconds. See if he can come back on. I'm glad not all the technical difficulties are my fault, but I would hope. I hope that. <laughs> hope uh, everything. Chris, if you can hear me. Um, if not, I'll send you a text. Do you have his slides? Um, no. Okay. All right. Because I was going to say I could, if he, he doesn't come back, I could, I could go through his slides, but we don't um, have. Well, we, I think Chris just tried um, going out and going back in, but in the meantime, um, let me see if, let me check and see if there were any questions sure. for you yet. Um, let's see. Uh, I don't think that there are no specific questions for you based um, on what I mean. The only comments, questions I see are from the. Oh yeah. Actually, hello, hello. Yes, I can hear you. Go ahead, Chris. Okay, I'm I'm so sorry. All right, so let me just go ahead and uh, skip the bad joke and uh, move ahead with the presentation. So, as Darren mentioned before, the National Weather Service has multiple offices that help with the marine forecasting. And our area in green in the Pacific shows the 5 million square nautical miles, roughly from the equator northward to 30 north, and from Central America and Mexico westward to 140 west. So it's a big chunk of the Pacific Ocean, especially for those that are transiting the, the Panama Canal. One thing that surprised me when I took uh, the branch chief position four years ago was how much uh, ship traffic there was. Uh, you know, going from southwestern United States uh, along the Mexican coast, Central Mexican, and especially through the Panama Canal. You know, there's literally hundreds of large vessels every day, and of course, thousands and thousands of smaller fishing boats uh, or, or tourist boats that are out there every single day. So we want to make sure that all these mariners are being able to access our forecasts and make the decisions. I did want to talk a little bit about the meteorology and some of the hazards during the winter time. Uh, one of the biggest uh, is, is not particularly winds, but waves. When, when there's a very strong low up in the, near Alaska from uh, the Ocean Prediction Center side of things, we're often getting extreme swell. Uh, so it'd be a northwest swell transiting our area. Uh, of course, that ends up having a longer period but that in combination with the wind waves can make for a, a much more hazardous conditions. Uh, local conditions where we get gales are shown in the colors here. So the areas are tied in, especially to the topography. Uh, down south, uh, there is the Gulf of Papagayo region, uh, as well as the Gulf of Tehuantepec of Southeast Mexico. So these areas are gap wind events. And when there's strong trade winds in the Caribbean, we'll get strong to near gale, sometimes gale force winds in the Gulf of Papagayo region, sometimes the Gulf of Fonseca. And then much more common is uh, gales to even storm events uh, in the Gulf of Tehuantepec, when you get a strong cold front moving across the Gulf of Mexico and that cold dense air banks up against the Sierra Madre Orientes in uh, Mexico. And they squirt through that in the Chavela Pass and you get very strong downslope wind events uh, 40, 50, sometimes even 60 knots of conditions. Clear skies, uh, but mountainous seas uh, that would respond to that very quickly. Uh, occasionally off of the, uh, the tip of Southwest Mexico, you can get gales and then gales within the Gulf of California, as well as the, the west side of the Baja California Peninsula. Uh, and moderate frequency of gales, the extreme northernmost Gulf of California and just uh, south of, of San Diego. Uh, fairly frequent to have gales. Um, so we don't have tropical storms or hurricanes during this time of year, but the combination of the swell, which is very common to have um, 10, 15, even 20 foot uh, seas uh, as swell reaching our area, as well as the local wind hazards that can reach up to storm event. So some of the tools, so some of the observations that we use, uh, we do rely upon any ships that are transiting the area um, typically, we would only have a handful of ships that we, we would see um, with wind observations. Those are very valuable to us. Pressure measurements are very valuable to us and, and the wave heights. So the estimate of the significant wave height, all of that is critical for us there. 
you can also see that we have um, some remote sensed information. So these wind barbs, those colored wind, uh, arrows, are wind speed and direction from space from a radar called a scatterometer. Uh, Darren showed some of that as well. Plus, we have another radar in space called an altimeter, and it gives us wave heights that are accurate to the nearest foot. Uh, so it's quite impressive what we can get uh, from remote sensed information. What we don't have are any moored buoys. So we have zero moored buoys to give us wave information in our entire area of responsibility for the Pacific. So it makes it a bit more challenging, a little bit more unknown. So that's why I have a plea for please have your company join the Voluntary Observing Ship Program, which is a global network of ships sending weather forecast offices their information. And so uh, right now only about 5% of all the ships transiting are actually sending us their observations. So joining VOS would really be helpful for us and can help us provide to you a better prediction. Another great tool for us is the satellite imagery. So these giant observatories in space that are watching the Earth are launched by NASA. They cost about a billion dollars each. They're paid for by US tax dollars. So thank you that are paying your income taxes. And then once they're checked out, then NOAA runs them in a facility at Suitland, Maryland. And for us as tropical meteorologists as, uh, in particular, we're using the imagery to help diagnose, well, where are the formative tropical storms and hurricanes? And during the winter season, it really is key for determining the location of winter storms, as well as uh, cold fronts and warm fronts. So a great, great tool for us. So it's a combination of in situ measurements from ships, uh, remote sense from radars in space, as well as imagery from space. So when we put together our forecasts, we're also using uh, models called com uh, computer models. Uh, some of these tools, we focus on global weather models that provide information for the entire globe. And so this allows us uh, to fill in our gridded database of winds and waves and use that as a starting point of the model in combination with our observations. Uh, and then we run one model locally. It's a, a wave model called the Nearshore Wave Prediction System. So that gives us consistent swell or waves generated from uh, winds uh, from remote send, from remote location, as well as local wind waves. So we want a consistent package of winds and waves that we're providing the, ma the mariner all the time. Uh, and we do so in a workstation called the Advanced Weather Interactive Processing System. We're actually in the process now of migrating from an older system that really didn't communicate as well with our, our, our colleagues at the weather forecast offices, uh, as well as being able to produce all the grids and graphics and text products that you need to be relying upon. So it's, it's exciting for us to move to, uh, to a new system. So how do you get the weather information? I mentioned this yesterday, and it really depends on A, where are you? And B, uh, what kind of technology you have on board? Uh, so we do know that there are still ships that uh, do have do not have reliable internet on board, and they rely on either Navtex with a medium range transmitter, um, or they may may use Vobra, uh, for what's like a NOAA weather radio, but for much further distances out over the open ocean, um, or you may use uh, Radiofax to get to the grid uh, graphical information via radio transmission. Um, I do want to uh, to encourage folks to you know, you access the forecasts uh, because if you're just getting it by windy.com, for example, that's not the official forecast from the National Weather Service. That's a single model and that uh, we don't rely on a single model to make the forecasts. We blend them together and during the hurricane season, we make sure that we're providing a consistent set of wind and wave products to match the official hurricane. So as Darren mentioned, there's also the unified surface analysis, which is a weather map that we use uh, and produce every six hours. Um, and I did want to show an example of that here. So uh, this is what it looks like right now. And so this is a combination of four different offices. The Ocean Prediction Center does the high latitudes of the Atlantic and the Pacific. Uh, the Honolulu Forecast Office does the uh, Central Pacific, west of 140. And we do the uh, tropical North Pacific. 
And in the Pacific today, it's fairly quiet, which is nice. Uh, a very uh, low latitude intertropical convergence zone in monsoon trough, a, a weak uh, trough extending a bit further north, not doing too much, and no cold fronts or warm fronts in our area of responsibility right now. So it's fairly quiet today, very different in the Atlantic as we were chatting about yesterday, uh, but fairly quiet today. All right. Back to where I was, sorry. And so we also have a uh, tropical weather discussion that we issue four times a day. And we focus on the big issues of the day. So if there's a gale warning or a storm warning, we would really highlight that in paragraph where the forecaster is discussing the current conditions and the forecast conditions over the next five days. Uh, and then we also break it up geographically as well. Uh, we split our marine forecast in the Pacific between the Mexican offshore waters, uh, the Central America and the Galapagos area, and then the remainder of the, uh, the seas. So we can take a quick look at our East Pacific uh, discussion. Uh, this was issued earlier today by Andrew Hagen, who coincidentally is leading the discussions today. So you can see we talk a little bit about what's going on now for the offshore waters of Mexico and what the forecast is for the next five days. And the same for Central America and out uh, along the equator and then the remainder of our, our high seas domain. So it's a, it's a great way to really peer into the forecaster's mind and see what they're looking at for what is causing uh, the winds and the waves. So when we make our forecasts and all the other stuff I'm gonna talk about is our forecast products, um, all of them derive from a gridded database. And so our grids of our winds, grids of our waves, as well as the warnings are, are comprised in that. And so that helps us develop the graphics of the uh, forecasts that are available both on the website as well as through radio facts, uh, as well as the high seas, uh, text forecast as in the offshore zones. So our high seas forecast information, this is the um, one mandated by the Global Marine Distress and Safety System. And so we do this four times a day and we really focus on the big stuff. You know, we focus on the uh, uh, eight foot seas or more or 25 knots or more, so strong breeze or, 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 or higher. Uh, and we have one product for the Pacific and one for the Atlantic. Um, so we also have the offshore zones. And so this is more detail. And you can see it's right along the shipping lanes of Mexico and Central America out to the Galapagos. So it's a detail of five days of what's going to occur as long as any warnings. Let's take a quick look of what's forecast uh, today by, by Mr. Hagen. And so we, uh, we have this nice interface, just a little pop-up GUI. So one of the big areas that's, uh, that's often uh, lighting up this time of year is the Tehuantepec area. So we can look at what's suggesting for Tehuantepec. Andrew has no gales, but it's pretty close. Uh, strong uh, near gale um, that are forecast for the next few days uh, with seas up to, in this case, looks like about eight to eight to nine feet. And if we're looking at the swell, kind of look at this area right off of Baja, California, usually has the biggest swell. Right now, it's it's fairly uh, quiescent, so not not uh, not too bad at all in the Pacific area. So for the radio facts, this is uh, where we're providing our graphical information, and it's the value-added uh, forecast provided by the, the forecasters, not directly out of a model. Um, and I did want to do a quiz here real quick, and if you could type in, uh, do you use radio facts? So, do you, so either yes, I use radio facts primarily, or I use it as a backup, or no, I never use radio facts. So please, it would be really instructive for us to see for the users here on the call today, uh, how many are using radio facts or how much, uh, how many of you have transitioned to, to a more modern technology? Because we, we need to know. We don't want to discontinue something if people are still using it. And we, we do know that the radio facts still has some use. Um, so we'll, we'll have Andrew tally that up uh, at the end of the talk. So I did want to show some of the products. This is a little bit of a training session here. So our surface progs are the forecast for the next one day, two day, and three days. And this is the ones for the Northeast Pacific. And we have an analogous group of products for the Atlantic, Caribbean, and Gulf of Mexico. And if we can take a look at what uh, is forecast, 
And at this point, uh, it is forecast uh, uh, that was issued earlier. And so you can see 72 hour prog is, uh, has a cold front clipping our Northwest corner, uh, but uh, no gales indicated. If we did have possible gale, we would be showing that here visually. Um, so fairly quiet for the next three days. When it comes to the waves themselves, uh, so we do uh, an analysis, we call it the sea state analysis, where we show the primary wave direction, as well as the significant wave feet in height. All of our products right now are in feet. Uh, we have heard since we're mainly focusing on an international community uh, that meters would be preferred. And so we, we may go to that in the future. For right now, all of our products are in meters. So let's take a, another quick look and see what the forecast is. Uh, this was the one issued uh, by Scott uh, Stripling this morning in 12Z. And you can see, uh, again, that Northwest swell, pretty prevalent this time of year, but only reaching about nine feet well Southwest of the Baja of California Peninsula. And nothing right now in the uh, Tawanapec, but that's going to change as that Tawanapecker starts getting going. We do the wind and wave forecasts. And so this is again day one, day two, and day three. We issue these twice a day, both in the radio fax schedule as well as our website. Uh, and we'll again take a quick look. Let's we'll see what's going on with the forecast. Uh, this was issued by Nelsi Ramos earlier today. And you can see that uh, it's fairly quiet. Um, 11 foot seas uh, way out near uh, 20 north and 140 west. Uh, the Tawanapec by then is going to be producing about eight foot seas, uh, but no gales are, are anticipated for the next three days. So, so fairly quiet, which is nice to see. Uh, we also provide wave periodicity and direction. Uh, this one is a little more different. It is right out of a model and it provides two pieces of information. Uh, what is the dominant wave direction, where it's coming from, and the colors indicate uh, the, the periodicity, that is how often are the waves coming by. So if it's a wind wave, you may have a, a, a wave coming by every, say, five to 10 seconds. If it's a swell generated from a long way away, uh, then it could be 15 up to even 20 seconds, a very long period wave. Um, and of course, the radio fax version is, is just black and white. So during the winter time, we switch to a high wind and seas graphic where it's a snapshot of any warnings in place that are 48 hours from now. And uh, this one uh, uh, is issued four times a day and it goes from December to May. Uh, middle of May, we switch over to a tropical cyclone danger graphic uh, and really focus on the hurricane uh, impacts that could occur. So again, we'll take a quick peek and see what's forecast. And right now, nothing. So area devoid of 35 knot winds um, at that 48 hour snapshot. So that's, uh, that's good news for folks wanting to transit. So one way that we're encouraging folks to want to modernize a little bit, uh, and if you have any website access, whether it's, uh, it's a shoreside operations, or if you do have website access uh, on, the, on your ship, is with our marine composite page. And so this is a way to take a look at what our grids are goes right into the details of what we can provide. And on the right side is an example from a strong Tawanapec event from a couple years ago. And the uh, colors represent significant wave height. So blue is uh, anything, um, you know, 10 foot or less. Uh, once it reaches uh, yellow, it's, it's 12 foot and red is about 20 foot. Uh, and so, so fairly strong Tawanapec event. On the left side, it's a colorized depiction of what our text is saying in the high seas, but in a graphical way. And so blue shows the eight foot seas or more. Uh, the orange shows 23 knots, so strong breeze or greater. Uh, and the combination is the combination of the two. And red would be gale. And briefly, you can see even a small area of storm force, uh, which is a fairly strong Tawanapec. Uh, so again, let's just take a look and see what is being forecast right now. Uh, that's the Atlantic, but we can just uh, go back to the Pacific version right here. Let's look at the full base in Pacific and uh, we can click on the wind barbs. That's from this morning at 12Z. We can click on wave heights and then you can actually choose here uh, feet or meters. So we'll, we'll do meters. And then the forecasts are drawn features or the weather map. And so this is from this morning, 
the blue indicates uh, really quiet conditions, uh, everything two meters or less pretty much. Uh, and then uh, we will look at tomorrow morning's conditions here, we scroll forward in 12 hour increments. So this would be showing for uh, Wednesday morning conditions, uh, not much change, a little stronger winds, uh, getting to a fresh breeze uh, way in our Western area. Uh, switching to Thursday morning, winds get a bit stronger on the west side of that trough. Um, but seas still only reaching about 10 feet or three meters. Uh, switching to Saturday morning, that trough is exiting the area, uh, but at the same time, a uh, cold front is entering our northwest corner. Uh, days four and five, we don't have our human drawn forecast features, uh, but we do have our grids that go out through five days. Uh, it looks pretty quiet the entire five days. So, boy, I wish I was on a ship uh, out over the Pacific uh, uh, right now. So I did, uh, so those are our products and services. And so I wanted to make sure you know about the uh, analysis of both uh, the, the waves as, as well as our text discussions and the products, both the uh, grids and as well as the, uh, the, the forecast graphics available on the website as well as uh, the uh, uh, radio facts. I did wanna spend a little bit of time talking about our partnership with the US Coast Guard. So unlike uh, whether the Air Force or the Navy or even the Marine Corps, the U.S. Coast Guard has zero forecasters by design. They don't have any forecasters. So every 10 years, there's a new agreement signed with the Weather Service where we and the Weather Service provide them forecasts and briefing support so that they, we can help them do their life-saving mission. And I'm sure you have a love-hate relationship with the Coast Guard, all the regulations that they have. But then if you're in trouble, please help us. So we're trying to help them help you when it's uh, when tr times get troubled. Uh, and one way we do that, uh, as Darren mentioned, is, is providing spot forecasts. And whether it's an uh, aircraft that has gone down or a missing ship or a disabled ship, man overboard, uh, could be an oil spill, uh, could be um, law enforcement activities where they're chasing the bad guy. You know, we don't even need to know. They just say, you know, District 11 in Alameda, California, we need a spot forecast at 20 north and 120 west. And we say, yes, sir. And we provide them the forecast. Uh, so last year we gave them um, 80 spot forecasts between the, the Pacific, the Caribbean, the Gulf and the, and the Atlantic. I also wanted to mention a bit about the weather ready nation. Uh, so there's a new component of this called the Marine Ambassador uh, that Andy Lotto, uh, who used to be at the Hurricane Center set up and so this is a way for us to interact with mariners on a more regular basis. Uh, in fact, we advertised for this event on the Weather Ready Nation and Marine Ambassador website. Uh, we have training materials on there uh, for, for mariners to learn more about the weather and, and products. Uh, and so please consider for your company uh, to sign up to be a Weather Ready Nation Marine Ambassador. Uh, the website's there. You just Google Weather Ready Nation uh, Ambassador and you can find uh, also, I did want to talk a bit about our, our social media presence um, as folks over the open ocean get more redundant high speed Internet availability. Uh, we want to make sure we stay relevant. And so one way is we uh, have a, a very large uh, Twitter uh, that we tweet a lot. And uh, for example, anytime we have a warning that's issued within 30 seconds, a tweet is issued. And so that's one way we can get out to the Mariners right away. Uh, that there's hazardous conditions that are now being forecast. Um, so we have 18 wonderful men and women, a uh, variety of great expertise between satellites and, um, and waves and numerical models and communications. And so uh, we're, we're there to serve. Um, and we even have a phone number. So if you are a, sh a mariner out over the Pacific and you have a question about the forecast, give us a call. 305-229-4425. Uh, there's our website, or you just go to hurricanes.gov and uh, click on the Marine side. And our Twitter account is uh, at NHC underscore TAFB. So I, I hope that was a useful overview. Um, maybe Andrew, uh, we could uh, you could tell us uh, how many folks how many ended up uh, saying that they, yes, they use radio facts versus don't use radio facts. Yes, um, I counted seven people that replied. Two said yes and five said no. Um, I think one or two of the no's said they used to. 
Um, and we also had, I believe, one or two other questions that I saw so far. Let me just recheck the questions box. Uh, again, mm -hmm. if you have a question for Chris or Darren, we'll take, um, you know, we'll, we'll have five minutes for questions. We'll go a few minutes after three o'clock because, uh, because we started a little bit late. Um, and uh, one question was about rogue waves. Um, so I guess either one of you could answer this. How often are rogue waves recorded and what causes them? Can start, and Chris. You can you could take it from here. This is probably a, certainly a, in the news lately. There was an unfortunate incident off of the southern coast of South America, where a vessel, I think the Viking Polaris, I believe that was one. I think it was the Octantis. I think it was a Polaris, uh, was was hit by a rogue wave with an unfortunate fatality. And yeah, rogue waves, since they they don't occur very often, um, at least as far as we know. Uh, then we don't, they don't get uh, reported to us very much. But uh, there's evidence to suggest that waves, you know, greater than two times a significant wave height, which I think is the definition of a rogue wave, uh, they, they do occur and they can be certainly very dangerous. Uh, they can occur, you know, with, with different current interactions, uh, certainly with uh, different interactions based on the aerial geography of the area that it focused on with the recent event, I think it was in Drake Passage. So you got, a, you know, the, the South American land, you got the Antarctic land just to the south, uh, really strong winds that occurred through there and some current, and that maybe makes that area a little bit more susceptible to a significant wave. So we don't get a lot reported to us, thankfully. It's not to say they don't occur in some place, maybe where our vessel's going on, and that's, that's fortunate as well, but it's something to prepare for. So if you're in a situation, for example, where you're, uh, you know, you're, you're where the wind is opposed to the current in the Northwest Pacific, you know, winds opposed to the Kuroshio current uh, in the Atlantic, you know, winds really opposed to the, the, the Gulf Stream uh, current. You know, that's where it's a situation to watch out for along with, um, you know, significant low pressure systems. Chris, any other thoughts? No, you, you covered it very well, Darren. Thank you. Okay, um, I just see one more. One more question, and that one is um, from Caroline Johnson. Um, one question on tools used for forecasting. How much are uh, autonomous vehicles now used for data gathering for wind and sea state? Yeah, I, I can address that a little bit. And Darren may jump in too. So there, there are more uses of um, little teeny ships that are unmanned that are out there collecting data. And one of the most successful in the last couple of years is, is what's called a sail drone. So it's uh, essentially a, a little surfboard that's got uh, meteorological information on it. It's got cameras on it. And uh, they use the winds and the waves to basically surf toward the areas that they want to. So uh, they do have some electronic control of a, of a rudder um, but they are at the mercy of the winds and the waves. And so they were able to get uh, into uh, a couple of hurricanes, the last two hurricane seasons, and, and measure some incredible uh, wind values and waves. Uh, two years ago, they, they measured uh, a maximum wave height of about 80 feet, uh, which was just phenomenal. And they, they, they made quite a bit of news. So for us, that information is pretty invaluable because we're hoping the ships stay away. And so if the ships are staying away, we lose data. And often some of the conventional buoys, they get hammered by a hurricane and we, they stop transmitting. Um, so getting these um, unmanned, uh, uncrewed vessels uh, into hurricanes is, is a great way to, uh, to observe what's going on. Yeah. And in addition to that, there are also gliders uh, that will go under the uh, under the top of the ocean surface, go under, you know, kind of underneath and in, in the ocean, if you will. And they'll also try to sense things like uh, ocean currents, uh, salinity, temperature differences. All that information gets into models as well and helps improve uh, the models that we have. You know, there's a there's starting to be a lot of competition for uh, these uncrewed vehicles out there. Uh, they are. Expensive, I think, to, to to run and maintain, and sometimes to get the data, you got to have data agreements. Just note that the, this data is part of, you know, a large suite of data that uh, we need over the open ocean, and so uh, uncrewed vehicles, gliders, ship reports, buoy information, satellite information, 
all of that is is, is needed uh, in conjunction with one another uh, to help uh, make our forecast situational awareness high, make sure the models have enough information that they run as accurately as they can, and ultimately making sure that we have the best forecasts and warnings out there for the safety legacy. Thanks. Um, let's do one more question. Um, is the VOS program open to recreational vessels? So yes, it, it is. Uh, I, I think it also it does, that depends on the. I will admit on the the amount of you know resources that the VOS program has to uh, you know fit a fit a, a vessel with equipment. Uh, work with an individual to uh, you know to maintain that equipment, make sure the reporting is there. But if you do, and and uh, Andrew, I don't know if you can find it and put it in the chat, but the Weather Service has a really neat website on the Voluntary Observing Ship Scheme. I think it's it's voss.noaa.gov. But but take a look at that and and see, uh, reach out and and uh, if if it's possible to join, and the program has the resources to get a recreational vessel involved with that. Uh, you know, they'll certainly work with you. Yeah, thank you. Um, there was just one one last question. This is the last one. And if, if there are other questions, then um, we, we have uh, the list of people and I believe we have your email so so we could get back with you. But the last question is, uh, will there be a webinar from the Honolulu office or Ocean Prediction Center uh, for on this year's ENSO predictions in the Northwest Pacific? Not that I know of. Um, Chris, if you want to stop sharing your screen, feel free. Um, I don't think right now that the that the um, that, that the Honolulu office is right now planning to do a webinar. It's not to say they they won't, but right now I don't have the information at hand that a webinar is forthcoming in, in the near future. Okay, well um, that will be the end. And again, we apologize for all of the uh, technical difficulties uh, uh, for the first ten minutes, um, but. Uh, Thank you everybody for joining. And um, if you have any questions, um, we, you know, you can always send emails to the webmaster at the Hurricane Center or the Ocean Prediction Center. And we, we appreciate your attendance and stay safe out there on the seas. Thank you very much. And I'll end the webinar now. Th thanks gentlemen for presenting. Thank you. Thank you.